Cannonsburg was a well-known frontier town, a burgeoning community, a town where a pioneer and a minister would join forces to bring about the inception of a town and a college. Both the borough of Cannonsburg and Jefferson College were officially founded in 1802, one year before the Louisiana Purchase. The borough offered a respite for the weary traveler on the stagecoach ride across the mountains and on their way west. The college was a destination for young men to be educated. The esteem for the institution was so great that it would be spoken of in the same breath with bastions of higher learning like Harvard and Yale. The glory of Jefferson College was at its peak during the middle of the 19th century. However, it fell on hard times as the War of the Rebellion greatly impacted enrollment, and eventually Jefferson College merged with Washington College and moved its remaining staff and students to the campus at the county seat with the formation of the Washington and Jefferson College. During the following decades, Cannonsburg transitioned from a sleepy college town to a bustling manufacturing center. The human capital necessary to fuel those industries came from overseas, as immigrants from Scotland, Ireland, Italy, Greece, Slovakia, Syria, and many other locations made their way to Cannonsburg with the promise of employment and the dream of a better life. It is certain that the members of the Cannonsburg community worked hard, so they needed diversions from their day-to-day -day life that gave them a chance to unwind. One such outlet was the Morgan Opera House. John C. Morgan's Opera House had entertained thousands of patrons, but suddenly on the night of August 26, 1911, it all came to a sudden end. August 26 was a typical summer Saturday evening in Cannonsburg. The streets were bustling with the locals as well as the many visitors that would come in on the weekend. One major attraction for the citizenry was the Morgan Opera House. Its two shows on Saturday would bring up to a thousand patrons through its doorway and up the stairs to the ticket box where they could select seating down in the orchestra section or climb higher to the bird's eye view from the balcony. Incoming and outgoing customers would often exchange pleasantries as they mingled in the lobby on the landing just past the ticket booth, but on this night, the throng of theater goers would have a completely different experience. For inside of the theater, the shout of fire rang from the balcony, and the internal drive to preserve life ejected people out of their chairs and towards the exit. No further signs of a conflagration came, but panic had already been planted and was growing within each step. When one person lost his footing and fell just before the exit, the push of the fearful came like a wave behind him, and they fell like dominoes on top. The surge of humanity behind gave them no chance to gather themselves and leave. Instead, the continuing wave crashed upon them, building up a wall of fallen bodies that eventually filled the doorway and halted the typical egress. One ingenious man saw another way out, but that was not without its costs. About 500 people total converging on this staircase, people coming up, people going down, and they just swept people off their feet, and it only took one person to fall a few steps up from the exit and everybody just started piling on top like dominoes until they were actually piled up to the top where the transom is. You couldn't see outside. Or there was a tiny little space. And that's when it got, you know, people were crushed, people were bloody, and that's when the infamous George Owen Cole jumped the banister, hit someone in the head, run across the top of the people, crushing people's faces and heads and body parts, and ran right up to the transom window threw the record player out that was up there that had the big morning glory horn. It was an old Victrola, and they would play music on there to entice people to come to the shows. It was advertisement. He threw that record player out on the street. Of course, townspeople were gathering all around the front of the building, and he broke the glass and came out that window and jumped down, and the townspeople were yelling. This is testified to kill him, kill him, because he's stepping on people, getting out of there, and a fight ensued. And when the fight was over, he went across the street and sat down on the curb, fell backwards, and died. So we don't know if he died from a heart attack, fear, panic, or from the beating. It was never determined. While hysteria ran wild in the balcony, lobby, and stairs, others who did not hear the warning sat oblivious in their seats and continued to enjoy the theater's entertainment. Eventually, the fire escapes, which were barely used by those leaving the building, were ascended by the police to the second floor so they could attempt to get the panic under control. There was two fire escapes. Nobody was using them at first, but the police, because they couldn't get in that front entrance, they actually had to use ladders and go in through the offices upstairs to get upstairs, and they start untangling the bodies from the second floor, like, 
you know, just working their way down. And they did take a lot of people down the fire escapes, uh, but a hundred, about 100 people stayed in the auditorium and never knew anything was going on. They continued to watch the movie. The piano player continued to play until a fireman walked in and said, you can quit playing now, Mary, because at the time he said something like, we have 10 or 12 dead out there. Those who had been previously unaware of any perceived threat were now directed out of the building and down the escapes. And in the lobby, policemen, firemen, and other citizens began to untangle the bodies of those who lay on the heap, with many injured, dying, or already dead. Lane's husband, Wilmer Lane, was a fireman. He stayed home that night, but he got called out on the emergency, and when he was helping untangle the bodies, he found his son Carl, still in the arms of his sister-in-law, Callie Young, who died. They were both dead, and she had her arms wrapped so tight around Carl that his body was imprinted with her embrace. He was bruised with that embrace, and he also found his daughter over in the Beetle Bakery laid out on the countertop dead, because she actually catapulted out of Mrs. Lane's arms. Mrs. Lane was carried down the steps in the sea of people, she said, and she held the baby over her head, but someone hit her and the baby launched from her arms and went out the opening. There was still an opening then and landed on the sidewalk and fractured her skull. Baby was only four months old. In the end, 26 lost their lives on that evening when there was no fire, only fear fueling their demise. It took the better part of a week for the dead to assume their final resting places. Church bells tolled in their memory.